On my way to church this morning, my son and I were in a discussion, and he says to me what he often says on a Sunday morning when I was preaching, Dad, how long are you going to preach? And we banter back and forth for a few minutes, and I said, an hour and a half, son. He turned to me and looked at me and says, well, that's only a few minutes shorter than Pastor Keith. <laughs> He's always got the last word. Brother, for you and Pastor Alex, thank you for your faithfulness to the word. Thank you for your unwilling to compromise the truth. It's a blessing to me. It's a blessing to my family. It's a blessing to our congregation. Encourage your brother to preach the word. I pray that I'd be faithful to him this morning in preaching the word. Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, if you will, and let's pray. Father, may this man decrease, and may Jesus Christ our Lord increase. May your people be encouraged. May those who don't know you as Lord and Savior respond in faith and repentance. And may Jesus Christ be exalted in all we say and do this morning. In whose name we pray, amen. Have you ever been tempted to give up, to just stop? A few years ago, I had taken a short vacation trip to Minnesota, up to the Gooseberry area where there are some waterfalls, beautiful location. And we had heard of these falls, so we had determined in our family that we were going to take a hike up to see the beautiful site. As we started, just like many falls, it was quite a journey. And this journey was not easy. It was up a, a series of plateaus, mountains, hills, whatever you want to call them. I call them mountains. The hike seemed to be pretty hefty. I had two young sons with me, younger than myself, obviously, and they had do what young sons do, taken off. So after what seemed to be a pretty long hike, with no sight or no sound of the waterfall, I was kind of exhausted. I wondered if I had taken the wrong turn because I had come to another part which seemed like the highest mountain yet, <laughs> the highest place to climb. I paused and looked up, honestly ready to stop. And then I heard the voice of one of my sons calling down to his father, Dad, I can hear the falls, I think. Matter of fact, I think I see them. Come on up, Dad. The writer of Hebrews wants his listeners to press on with endurance and to not give up. Our brother has already read it for us this morning, but let me read it again. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and give you some context before we get into the meat. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now consider him who endured such sinners, such endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. Who was his audience here, the writer of Hebrews was talking about? Who was he seeking and urging them to keep running? Well, obviously, it was those who had come to faith in Christ, those who had confessed Jesus as Lord. And that was no little thing in those days. Remember, to confess Jesus as Lord would mean not to confess that Caesar was Lord. Caesar was the one in which if you lived in that time, you were to bow to. Caesar was the one that you were to pay homage to. But the Christians knew firsthand that if they did not bow to Caesar, what would happen? They'd be persecuted. We hear stories from extra-biblical material that many were tortured and beaten and put in prison. Even some burned at the stake for simply confessing they were believers in Jesus. Most conservative scholars put this particular book in about 65 A.D. in terms of Paul or whoever wrote it. I think it was probably Paul. We won't go into that debate this morning. But, but the writer of Hebrews is probably somewhere in, or in the middle 60s. Well, in history, in 49 A.D., there was a 
huge persecution against the church by Claudius. And then in 60 AD, another emperor came to fame, and his name was Nero. Nero was probably harsher than Claudius. So these years behind, they, uh, these years prior to this writing, there were people that were being persecuted. Matter of fact, the writer of Hebrews gives us a glimpse of this. Hold your finger in chapter 12. Turn back to chapter 10 for just a moment. I want you to see this. Chapter 10, verse 32, he addresses his recipients. He, re, he addresses those who were listening to his writings or reading his writing here. Here's what he says. Sorry, i got to get my glasses here. Get over 50, can't see. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, after you came to know Christ, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. So sometimes it was you, sometimes it was your brother and sister in Christ, but you stood with them. Verse 34, for you had compassion on those in prison. Now he's not talking about those put in prison because they did something wrong. He's talking about those put in prison because they stood for Jesus. And you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Some of them took things away from your house. If it was in our days, our cars, our property, our house. Since you knew, notice, you yourselves had a better possession and abiding one. Therefore, same people he's writing to in chapter 12, do not throw away your confidence or don't throw away your faith, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. So he writes here to the church. Notice some of the words he uses. He tells them to press on, hold on to their confidence or their faith. He tells them that do this in the midst of suffering. He tells them to endure, 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 keep going. And he tells them there would be a reward. These same words you see in chapter 11, and we see it again in chapter 12. He's wanting them to listen. He's wanting them to get it. And so that's the big view. That's the 50,000, 40,000 foot view. That's the overview. Now I want to take you down to the ground when we get to chapter 12, verse 1. And here's what he says. Therefore, brothers and sisters, matter of fact, I don't have time to go back to chapter 11, but let me remind you of what happens in chapter 11. What happens? He gives a roll call of faith. He says, these guys have been faithful. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. You see, he's seeking to motivate the believers in that day by telling them, you're not the only one who's faithful. You're not the only one who's trying to follow Christ. There have been faithful brothers and sisters in your past. And you're surrounded by all these witnesses. And in fact, in chapter 11, again, I'm not going to go there, but let me remind you, there was Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Gideon and David and Samuel. <sighs> all of those in there, and there are more. <laughs> and he says, these were faithful brothers and sisters who endured. They didn't give up. They had faith in Christ. And so he's seeking to encourage and motivate those he's writing to with the story of the faithful. Why? Why does he do this? For this reason, brothers and sisters. The faith of others stirs up faith in us. The faith of others stirs up faith in us. Now this is all introduction, by the way. Hang in there with me. But this is important because he's trying to motivate them. Later he's going to mot motivate you with something more important than this. But initially he wants to remind these faithful followers who are going through struggle and persecution that the faith of others will stir up faith in us. The Bible tells us this. We see this in Christian history that those who are witnesses of Christ and have trusted in him and you hear their stories, what does it do? It encourages you. Matter of fact, I could dare say we could walk into Pastor Keith's library and find story after story, biographies after biographies, sermons after sermons of faithful men and women who've held on to the gospel to the very end, have they not? And when you read those, I encourage you to read those, read them, listen to them, hear them. What does it do in your heart? It says, that's great, I want to be like that. Ah, it stirs up faith in us. Not only do we hear this, see this here, 
But let me also tell you, this is why we need the church. This is why we need to meet together. Because when I hear of God working in your heart, when I hear the stories of how you've put your faith in Him, or even how you're struggling to put your faith in Him, you know what it does in me? This is great. I want to be like that. This is encouraging. Encouraging me to run the race. It spurs us on to love and to good deeds. And as you testify with your mouth and you give evidence of God's work in your life, it builds my faith. Now three things, back to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Three things the writer of Hebrews wants us to take action or to do this morning. As we press on in this race of sanctification, we are to give up, we are to run forward, and we are to look straight. Now repeat it after me. Give up, give up, run forward, look straight. You got my outline, we can go home, right? No. Let me dig down a little deeper. This is our roadmap this morning. And let's start with give up. Verse 1, after he seeks to motivate us that we have a surrounded by these witnesses, he says to us, particularly verse 1, the second part of it, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. So the first commandment that the writer gives us is we are to lay aside something. He calls it the sin and the weight. To lay aside. Lay aside just means that you take an action to do something. He's commanding us to not sit idly by, but to seek, to renounce, to get rid of, to put off. There are two things he mentions here. One is weight, and the other is sin. And by the way, any commandment that God gives us, that he tells us, here's what I want you to do, he doesn't leave you by yourself to do it. He always provides the desire and the motivation, the power and the grace to accomplish those things. So I'm going to give you some commandments here, but I want you to understand, you can't accomplish those in your own power. You can't do them in your own strength. You can try, but you'll always fail. What God does is he plants in you the desire. He gives you the Holy Spirit and then says, I want you to obey me. I want you to follow me. And so as we follow him, we're constantly needing to call out for his grace, to call out for his mercy. And when I seek to obey, it's grace-motivated obedience. God's worked in my heart. This is why I even desire to do those things. And I can't accomplish them without him. So please understand, every commandment that you're given, you're also given the grace by Jesus' work in your heart to obey that commandment. Commandments are grace motivated for the believer. So he tells you, put it off, lay it aside. Can you? Yes, you should. And he'll give you the power to do such. Now he tells us two categories here. The first one is weight. This word means encumbrance or hindrance. Something that gets in our way. Something that keeps us from running the race. Now I take this to say, these are not necessarily sins, because he gives us the word sin, although they can become sins. Because of why? They're in our way from keeping us from running the race. Or they become sins because we make them out to be more than they're supposed to be. They make, we make them out to be idols. We serve these things rather than Christ himself. What could a weight be? Well, it could be cars. It could be money. It could be houses. It could be gadgets. It could be clothes. It could be recreational stuff. Let's go on and on. I guess it could even be fishing. I love to fish. So if you want to invite me to fish, I'll go with you. But the truth is, any of those things, I'm not as much a, a hunter, pastor, sorry, but invite me, I'll come. I'll try. I just don't, anyway, fishing, fishing's the, the thing, I love to fish. So if you're a fisherman out there, invite me, I'd love to come. But any of those things, brothers, you know they can become weights because they lead us upside and put us apart from Christ. Doesn't mean you can't fish, doesn't mean you can't hunt, that's not what I'm talking about. But any weight that keeps us from doing God's will needs to be put off. Any material things that become more important than God and keeps us from running the race that he set before us it may not just be material things. It could be fear. It can be insecurities. You could put in a whole lot of things here. What the writer is saying is lay them aside. 
put them off. Like you'd have an old dirty jacket. You take it off at the door, you leave it at the door, and you walk the other direction. Give up the weight. But he also tells us to give up the sin. Sin is just, in this particular picture here, is a departure from doing what is right. Twice in Ephesians, once in Colossians, Paul lists all kinds of sins that we are to put off, sins that we struggle with. Ephesians 4, verse 31 says, Put these off, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice. Any of you struggle with those? You don't have to raise your hand. He goes on in chapter 5 to give us another list. Sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talk or curse, crude joking. And then in chapter 3, which brother will get to soon, he, t he gives us another list here. Verse 5, he says, put off these things. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, covetousness, which again is greed, anger, wrath, malice, slander, Obscene talk from your mouth. I mean, we could go on and on. Do you, do you need more lists? Probably not, right? What does Paul say about these things? What does the writer of Hebrews tell us? Put them away. Put them off. Paul's pattern of discipleship, by the way, didn't matter if he was writing to the Colossians or to the Ephesians or whatever. It's the same pattern. He says, you, as believers who've come to be saved and now you're being sanctified, you're to put off the old way of life and you're to put on the spiritual opposite, what is right. You see, you don't just put off, but you also put on. So those are lists there. That's another sermon. But we are to put off these things, sin and weight, which easily cling to us. Sin gets its grip on us. It holds us tightly. It entangles us. So you can't run a race with a 30-pound backpack, can you? <laughs> Not very easily. You have to put the backpack off. You have to get rid of the sin. You have to get rid of the weight if you're going to run forward. And that's what he's encouraging them to do. Run forward. You see, we're in a battle against sin. But here's the truth. We often treat our sin more like a pet than we do a pest. Let me dare say that you would treat your dog like you would a fly, right? Or your cat like you would a fly. Any of you have animals? <laughs> what do you do with your animals? You take care of them. You feed them. You protect them and defend them. Dare say any of you have a pet fly, do you? Any of you have a pet fly here? What do we do with pet flies? We don't have pet flies. What do we do with flies? We get us fly swatter after them, don't we? And if it's at night, it might keep us up at night till we get the thing killed because you can't sleep. Especially at night, it you know, flies around your, your ear and it, it bugs you. And so I have lost hours of sleep in my room at night trying to kill a pesty fly. And I guarantee you, I'm going to kill it before I can go to sleep. I'll stay up and I'll look at it and I'll beat it and I'll squash it or whatever I can do to get rid of it. The scripture calls us to make radical war against these things. The scripture calls us to make sure that we're not holding on to the very things that God says get rid of. We're to seek to put it off, to kill it, to beat it to death, to mortify it. And this is a constant thing, brother and sister, because our sin loves, our flesh loves to do these things. It loves the sin. We are to hate the sin. We are to hate the things that God hates. And if you're going to make any progress in this life in terms of sanctification, you have to be willing to to put off the sin. Now remember, it's grace-motivated work, but yet it is work. What are we to do? Give it up. Put it aside. And so the first instruction that the writer gives us here is we are to make a habit of giving up sin and weight. We are to be repenting repenters. You know, you came to Christ through repentance. Repentance and faith. Not started a life, but that doesn't end it. It's just the beginning. Every day we find sin in our heart that we need to repent of. And so you need to make a pattern of that in your life. Whatever sin the Lord's putting his finger on, give it up. So I ask you this morning, what is the Lord putting his finger on? I flew through those passages, but the Holy Spirit can work in your own heart to show you. What are those things that are keeping me really from following Christ? What are those things that I hold on to? What are those things that I love? 
like a pet. And it should be like a fly. It should be beating it to death. So, brother and sister, I encourage you, give it up. But that's not all he has for us. He also wants us to run forward. Look with me, the last part of verse 1. We're surrounded by witnesses. Lay aside the sin. Then he tells us, let us run with endurance the race set before us. The next command here is that we are to endure. We are to run. He pictures for us a race that we're moving forward. They're making progress. We're rapidly running. Running takes effort. We are to strive hard, to work at it. With the grace that God provides, it requires a deliberate choice. You see, there are two extremes that we have to be careful of. One ditch on one side and one ditch on the other. But one ditch is that God does it all in this race of sanctification. I don't have to do anything. God's just going to do it. On the other side, it's I have to do it all. <laughs> no, it's both and. It's always that in the Scripture. We must give God glory Point out his grace in us. We can never take credit for anything we do. At the same time, I can look at you as a pastor and say, because Christ is in you, do it. Walk this way. Why? Because that's what the scripture tells us to do. It's a grace-motivated choice, but it's a deliberate choice by us to not only put aside, but to run forward. As I was standing at the bottom of the hill is what I interpreted as a great mountain there in Minnesota. I had to make a decision. Was I going to stop and call out to my boys what was really going on inside my heart in some ways? I need to turn around, guys, and go back to the car. And I'm not going to make it up this last hill. Not only am I going to make it up, I've got to pull my wife up with me. Okay, maybe she was ahead of me. I better be careful there, right? I don't really remember. But anyway... It came out more than what I intended it to. But anyway, I'm ready to quit, boys. Or was I going to make every effort to make it up that final hill? Well, the word race here is an interesting word because it comes along with the idea of conflict or struggle. It's the idea that's spoken of, that's, that's spoken of here is that a race that is filled with difficulty. It's not an easy race. We're not promised a smooth flat land. We're not promised a downhill race. That's what I'd like to have at times, right? No, the race of sanctification will include peaks and valleys, but it will also include mountains and difficulties. It's a struggle-filled race is actually the picture here. Not only will it be a struggle-filled race, but what's really fascinating about this passage is that it is a race that is set before us. Think about that for a moment. It's not a race that we designed. It's not a course that we've chosen because we think we like this course. It's a race that was set before you. You see, knowing what I know now about that climb up the mountain, I probably would have chosen the scenic route by hiring a helicopter, flying over. You get it? Are you with me sometimes? If you're young, you don't get it. If you're my age, you might get it a little better. I don't know. But here, I must run you to the cross. I must take you to Jesus because Jesus is our example. Look in verse 2. Notice it says that he had a race that was set before him. Looking to Jesus. Now, we're going to get to the looking in just a moment. But notice, he is the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was what? Set before him. He endured the cross. Jesus' race included the cross. Follow with me on this. This is why he came. This is the important thing for us to latch onto and to grasp. The cross was planned by God from the beginning of time. God could not save the world and save his son from the cross at the same time because he'd chosen. This is the way the redemption must happen. I must sacrifice my son for you to be saved, for you to receive salvation, for you to be cleansed, for you to be redeemed. This is the way it must happen, and I'm going to send my son to do it. And Jesus accepted the assignment. Amen. You see, the secret of Jesus' life was not in doing his own will, 
but in doing the will of his Father. Did Jesus not teach us when he came to this earth, not my will, but thine be done? Did he not teach his disciples to pray that very prayer? Did he not say on the night he was going to the cross, Father, let this cup pass from me. But he didn't stop there, did he? Hallelujah. He said, but Lord God of heaven, my Father, not my will, but yours be done. You see, it was faith in his Father. It was obedience to his Father that was the secret of Jesus' obedient life. Make no miscalculation. The cross was a shameful, disgraceful way for one to end their life. The Roman cross was reserved for the harshest, hardest of criminals around. The, the dishonor and the humiliation was known throughout the community. The Jews knew that someone died on a cross. That was a bad thing. It was shameful to be crucified. So how could this passage tell us that Jesus saw the cross as joy? Because the cross was the path of obedience. He listened and obeyed the Father's will to the very end. The joy set before Jesus was not an agonizing, disgraceful, shameful cross, but instead it was the joy of doing the will of his Father. It was the joy of finishing the task completely. It was the joy of not giving up on the race, but racing through the race to say, God, I will do as you have told me to do. I will do as what you have said. I will follow you. I will take the path that you set before me, and I will walk it. Praise God Jesus didn't quit. Amen? If Jesus quit, we're all in trouble. But by his grace, he didn't quit. As Jesus took on flesh, his greatest desire was to listen and obey the Father's will to the very end. He was, his greatest desire was to finish the race, and by his grace, he did. By, by his grace, we receive that. When Jesus accomplished everything on the cross, what did he say? It is finished. That's what you say when you finish the run, right? You finish line. You're done. It's finished. A very critical moment. Jesus finished the race the Father had set for him, and he cried out, It is finished. Jesus' joy was found in running the race to the very end. And, of course, we give praise and glory to him that he endured from such sinful men what he did not deserve, but he didn't give up. What will characterize the race set before us? Well, let's be honest. Suffering, difficulty, hardships, trials, wars, struggles. We could go on and on. In 2 Corinthians, we find the race that was set before Paul. I don't think any of us want this race, but look what it says here. Paul says in his own testimony, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a night I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger of rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Whew, that's hard to even read. This is what Paul's race was like. I don't wish that on any of us, right? The truth is we all will go through difficult times. Not an easy race here. But God had taught Paul some very deep things through his race and through his journey. So if you only turn over one more chapter in 2 Corinthians, this is how, what he says. I want you to hear this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 9 and 10. It says, For the sake of Christ then... Here's Paul's conclusion to this, these things. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Can you say that as, as Christ takes you through difficulties? You see, Paul had been taught by God some very deep things. God often takes you through difficult times, brothers and sisters, to teach you about his grace, his mercy, his love towards you. He wants it to be deep. He wants it to be real. 
Paul had learned reliance. He had learned dependence. He had learned trust in Christ. Because God had set a race before him, and he didn't run off the race, get off the path. God had used this passage to remind me that we are in a run, that we're in a race, race of sanctification. And that race is not to gain some temporal reward, nor is it to gain the praise of people. We all crave that. Pastors do. No, we run for the glory of one, Christ our Lord. And so I urge you, brothers and sisters, run forward. Run for his glory. Work at it hard. I can tell you, work at it hard because it's for the praise of his glory. The third thing we notice is that we are to look straight. We're to run forward. We're to lay it aside, give it up. But we're also to look straight. Verse 2 picks up this idea and continued briefly in, also in verse 3. But look with me. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What are we to do? Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. You see, the greatest motivation for the Christian life is found in looking at Jesus. It's him that we look at. It is his person that we must focus on. Why? Because Christians, you are Christ followers. You're to follow him. We're not to run a race in such a way that pleases ourselves, but that pleases God. That means we will have to give up some things. We'll have to make some choices. We'll have to run hard. We are to look straight at Jesus. This straight at Jesus, looking straight ahead, has two focuses here I think this morning I want to share with you. First of all, is that we should focus on Jesus, and second, we should meditate. So it has both the idea of meditation and focus. First, the word focus here is the idea of let your gaze, look straight, looking to Jesus, look straight, let your gaze be on him. Let your eyes look directly to him. You know, do we have any gymnasts in here or prior gymnasts? I learned when I was a little bit younger, my first daughter who took gymnastics, and we thought she'd be the world gymnastic. They taught her when she was on the balance beam to do something very interesting. Don't look down at your feet, but look ahead. If you look at the beam, you know what happens when you look at the beam? You fall off. You're not to look down, you're to look ahead. It's the same concept if you're a waiter or a waitress, how you carry food or how you carry your coffee in the morning. I'm going to teach you something. If you carry your coffee, kids, to your mom and dad this Tomorrow morning, don't look at the coffee. Look where you're going and you won't spill it. If you look at the coffee, you know what happens? It's all over the floor. I've done it many times. Looking to Jesus means we have our gaze at him. Because there's so much around us in the world that's going to get us off. There are ditches there. There are problems there. There are all kinds of difficulties that can move us off the pathway. But how do we stay running and enduring. How do we stay moving forward? We look to Him. We have our focus on Christ. It has to be that we're having our gaze directly at Him, looking straight ahead. Why? Because the Scripture tells us in verse 2 that Jesus is the founder and perfecter of our faith. Let that be an encouragement to us. He is the founder. It's the idea that he is the source, but he's also the initiator of our faith. He's both the source, that is, that's where you go for faith. That's where you go to learn about faith. That's where you go to find faith. The faith you need comes from Christ. It is a gift to be received from him. If you believe, it's because you have looked at him and you have believed what he has to say. Jesus is the one who gives you the faith. He is where the faith comes from. He is the source of all things, and he is particularly the source of the Christian's faith. But he's also the perfecter of that faith. 
That means that not only is he the source, but you can't leave him behind once you become a believer. You see, the very things that you need for salvation are the things you need for sanctification. How were you saved? You were saved through faith and repentance. Do you know what you need today as a believer and walking in him? The same thing. Faith in Christ and repentance of your sins. Now, it's different because now you're a believer. You have new power, new desires, new way. But you live the same kind of way. Jesus, I trust you today. What are the sins I need to put off and repent of? Different attitude, different desires, different way. But we're perfected in the same way in that sense. As we grow, faith is critically important. You see, Jesus not only plants the faith in you, he plants the seed. By the way, if he plants the seed of faith in you, it will grow. It will grow if he does it. <laughs> Just give it time. If it doesn't, the seed's not there. But as it grows, he also waters it, takes care of it, brings the sunshine. He lets your faith grow. You know, Pastor Keith told us a few weeks ago that God's plan in the walk and the sanctification process of bringing us in terms of faith included pain and purpose for the pain. You see, we don't rejoice in the pain. But we do rejoice that God is in the midst of the pain with us and he's, he's playing out his purposes. That's how he perfects us. He's working in us in the midst of the valley of the shadow of the death to do what? To remind us that he's with us. That his rod and staff is there to comfort you. To remind you that he has not left you in the pain by yourself. Jesus is with you. He's with you this morning. And he's in the process of perfecting you in that. What do we need to do? Set our gaze on Jesus. Look to him. Don't let our minds and our eyes go to the wrong things. When we look to him, verse 3 tells us that we need to consider him. I think this is a step even more deeply. Not only do we look to him, but we are to consider. That means to concentrate. It means to meditate on him. It means to think about him. So you need to let your mind think about his actions, his thoughts, his attitudes. Jesus is the one who's perfecting you. Then turn your mind to him. Remember, Jesus sets before us a race. A race in which he is seeking to purify us more and more, to make us more like him. He wants to make your faith stronger, deeper, wider, and more enduring. He knows best how to do that, does he not? Because he knows us well. Not only does he know best how to do that, he's our model. As we meditate and ponder his life, we find that Jesus kept his eyes on who? The Father. He focused on God. He knew God. It was his abiding relationship with his Father that guided him through the suffering and the trials. He kept his heart on the Father and on the Father's purpose, on the Father's will. Yes, Father had a purpose for the pain. Jesus was sent to die for sin. Jesus' joy was running so that the Father would say at the end, well done, my good and faithful servant. He did not let the hostility of this world distract him from the purpose to redeem a lost world. His endurance was about his relationship with God, his relationship with his dead. He trusted his Father he believed his father. He didn't turn his back on his father's plan or his father. He set his gaze straight before him and endured the cross, despising its shame. Because he had considered in this life how he might do the father's will and please him. And so in the same way, brothers and sisters, this considering takes time, it takes effort, it takes pondering. And also it takes faithful endurance to the end. When standing at the bottom of that hill, you probably thought I'd never get back to it. The large, steep hill did not motivate me to move forward, to be honest. Can I just be honest with you? I didn't take one step because I loved the pain. I didn't take one step because I was panting. I didn't take one step because I felt good about this hard climb up the hill. You know what made me? I heard my sons crying out, Dad, it's up here. Dad, I see the falls. And then it reminded me of the purpose why we were climbing this crazy hill to begin with. The words reminded me that there was a waterfall at the end. 
I wanted to see this beautiful waterfall. I wanted to see the crystal clear water flowing over the rocks and splashing in my face because I was a little hot at that time. I wanted to experience it. So what did I do? I marched right up that mountain. If I can say dragging my wife with me. And then we finally arrived. It was outstanding. It was amazing. It was everything and more than I thought. As I saw that beautiful waterfall and I felt that cleansing cold crystal water splashing on my face, I said, yes. Was it worth it all? Yes. Yes, yes. A thousand times yes. Was the journey difficult? Yes. But you know what? I soon forgot about that. I really didn't remember all that until I started preparing the sermon like this. But there's a truth, brother and sister, that's way more valuable than a waterfall. There's one who's way more satisfying. There's one who's way more important. There's one who's worth all the effort. And that man's name, a God man. <laughs> that God's name is Jesus. He's the one. In looking at him and in considering and pondering his life and meditating on his thoughts and meditating on the attitudes that he had, Jesus alone satisfies. He's enough. And he's worthy of all of our love and devotion. And so when we look to him, when we consider him, when we're saying, Jesus, we love you. What we're saying is, Lord, you are my greatest joy. You are my greatest treasure. There is none other. And so I encourage you, study, ponder, think about, analyze Jesus' life. And run to him. So that you can learn how he ran. And you can run the same way. His choices are the model for us. His life in you is the power to accomplish the race. So let the song that motivates our obedience, let the song that replays in our heart and our mind over and over and over in this struggle-filled race, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. He's worthy of your and my full devotion and full attention. So I say to you, brothers and sisters, press on. Press on. Why? Because Jesus is worth every effort. Give up the sin. Run forward with endurance. Look straight ahead. Focus on him. Consider his life. These will keep us from growing weary and faint-hearted. You know, it doesn't say we can't have weariness and faint-hearted at times, but it says we don't grow in it. We don't stay in it. And how do we not stay in it? These very things that the passage tells us. Give up the sin. Run forward with endurance. The race God's given you. Don't try to find another race. Look straight at Jesus. And it will help us not to become weary and faint-hearted. And when you come to the finish line, you know what you'll see? What will you see? The face of Jesus. You'll see him face to face. And then you will say... It was worth it all. So press on. Finish well. Brothers and sisters, let's pray. Well, Father, I pray that your people will hear your word. They will truly look to Christ. They'll know that you, Jesus, are encouraging us on the route, and one day we will see you face to face. Let us not grow into weariness and give up on you. Let us not be like those who have deconstructed their faith and determined that Christ was not worthy. Oh God, please forgive them, save them, deliver them. But oh Lord, may we not be those people. May we be people who finish well. And so I pray for you, these here. That they would move forward with endurance. The race you've set before them, looking at Jesus. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.